coffee break on the science and practice. I'm very pleased that we uh, could find uh, Patrick Ten Brink um, prepared to talk about the policy side of, uh, of ecosystem services. Uh, Patrick is uh, head of the Brussels office of the Institute for European and Environmental Policy. Um, and he was the coordinator in the TEEP study on uh, the policy, national and international policy work and the, the chapter, actually the whole book. On, uh, I suppose he was going to show this himself, but I can show it here for in his place. Um, on uh, the policy uh, recommendations coming out of the TEEP uh, project. And he's also on the scientific advisory board of the Dutch uh, government's national TEEP study, which is just uh, starting up. So without further ado, please, uh, Patrick take the floor and share your experiences with uh, the topic of ecosystem services and policy making. Great. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's always a bit dodgy to, s to clap before one's actually given the speech. But anyway, first of all, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to present. And it's nice to come back to the Netherlands. My family, my ancestors lived, left here about 100 years ago, so it's taken me 100 years to come back, so that's a great pleasure. Um, so, as I mentioned, I'm Patch Temmick of IEP, we're a non-profit institute and we work on trying to support uh, uh, environmental policy in Europe, but also the global dimension. Um, you'll see here at the bottom there's a number of logos. Uh, in, I think Dolph earlier said that the, the T process had been launched uh, by the German government. It was also co-launched with the Commission and then over time more and more countries, the UK, the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway and so on and Japan have all come on board. So this process has been one of increasing engagement uh, by various parties. Now I'm going to talk a little bit first to give an overview of the T process um, just so that you see the whole picture then talk about the fact that there's a growing appetite for uh, the integration of ecosystem services in policy making. Then I'll explore a little bit the different policy instruments that have been used uh, so far and then some discussion of the way forward because I think the way forward requires all of us in this room plus a lot more people. So if you go all the way back and I think that we've already had part of this, the starting point is arguably the, the CBD convention, the Millennium Ecosystem Ass Assessment, the Stern, plus the huge wealth of literature which the community has been doing for 20 years and of course Bob Constanza is one of the, the leading lights on that and Professor Pierce who was my professor, another and there are very, very many. In the TEAB process we've produced a range of different outputs uh, targeted at different audiences. So we did the TEAB for policymakers. there's also TEAB for local and regional administrators, there's TEAB for business and then there's a scientific foundation. So each of these are trying to present the same evidence or uh, variations of a theme of the same evidence to a different audience. If I just go back here. Um, and very recently there's also a TEAB manual for cities and the whole process will continue towards the future COPs and as we'll see tomorrow and later there's a range of national teams and sector work. So th there's a, an interesting process and first of all thanks probably to uh, a large fraction of the people in this room because we'll see there's 500 authors contributed. I know there's a number already here. So if I say anything intelligent it's probably thanks to you and if I say anything stupid it's definitely thanks to me. So I'll just do my best to honour it. Now, Benjamin Franklin understood this problem 200 years ago, and he said, I believe that the great part of the miseries of mankind are brought upon them by the false estimates they have made of the value of things. So he understood ecosystem services way beyond anyone in this room. And now this is what will happen by 2050 if we don't do anything about it. We know coral reefs are in major danger from climate change. We know from fisheries that we're overusing our fish stock. Um, and leading to ri uh, risks of, of collapse. We're not making best use of our planet. However, before we all get despondent, and Gretchen Daly and other leading lights said there's a renaissance underway in which people are waking up to the tremendous value of natural capital and devising ingenious ways of incorporating these into resource decisions. So there is optimism, there is hope. So the critical issues uh, that I want to touch upon in the speech is that the value of biodiverse and ecosystem services are not fully reflected in our markets, in the price signals, in our policies and the decision making not just at the policy level but also for citizens and companies still often fails to take it into account the local to global benefits and so on and that contributes to the loss. However there's a range of tried and tested tools that reward the benefits and a growing policy interest and that's at local, regional, national and international level whether it's from policy or, or also the good work of Conservation International 
and there's private, public and of course public tools to engage the private sector. And there's a growing use and major potential for additional applic uh, applications. And here there's a key issue in new instruments, and I think Rosemary knows this better than anyone, to make them work you really need to be very careful on conditionality, additionality, verifiability and have a mechanism of engagement to ensure trust. And this then builds very much on the whole issue of, of understanding of the ecosystem services and interaction between the ecological systems, the social and economic systems. And then addressing it, addressing the ecosystem service benefits um, and, and understanding the links back to the biodiversity and the ecosystem functions and identifying who benefits is critical to this whole process. So those are some sort of key points which will, will come out of the presentation. So in short, to put this into pictorial form, this is really what we need to try to understand uh, from a policy perspective. In the middle, you have the biodiversity and ecosystem functions. This lead to services which lead to human welfare and well-being, and we have a range of tools to help value that. Some are economic tools, but they don't have to be economic tools. And of course, there's a range of pressures on that, of which policies are one of many. So we need to understand this interaction. I think that's the common challenge for all of us because it's not a simple relationship. Uh, it's non-linear, all these changes, and there's a huge, huge need to understand all of this and build upon it. Now, in the team work, we also try to, but towards the end here we have the valuation, but in the team work we try to look at some of the interesting evidence, and we collated the uh, evidence from across the world, from, from uh, 50, 60 countries in the team book and other countries there, um, and there's interesting evidence that ecosystems provide goods and services at lower cost than many man-made technological alternatives, but we often focus on these man-made technological alternatives, and I think Bob talked about the levies for flood control. Um, and if you go through it, you can go through across the world, and you find that there's a huge wealth of information. Everyone knows about the the US Catskills Delaware watershed where you can save billions. The same issue is for New, Z New Zealand which is supporting hydropower, the city itself, the farmers. In Mexico there's a really very fascinating PES scheme which addresses a number of issues of aquifer recharge, water quality, deforestation and poverty. And the list goes on and I live in Belgium and we care about beer so we have a PES for beer and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so you find actually that there's a range of different issues addressed, a range of different parties, and the conclusion is that for the policy we need to appreciate where there is potential for value for money and savings, and treat natural capital at least as an equal to the other capitals. And they also have co-benefits, which is why I mention at least. Now, if you look back at the last list, or, or the general literature, you see the beneficiaries here, the public sector, you know, the water companies, uh, public goods, the whole issue of public goods, the private sector, citizens, communities. There's been a range of decisions which have been influenced by ecosystem services from conservation to green infrastructure to PES to land use planning. And there's a range of policy synergies on water, on climate, on jobs, on security, on finance, industrial uh, policy, consumer affordability and poverty. Each of these areas are touched upon by biodiversity. Oh, and biodiversity is also uh, benefits from ecosystem services. The point I'm trying to make here is that we in the biodiversity community or the environmental community focus on this one issue, but in fact to move forward one has, one has a lot of other buttons to be able to press, these policy synergies of, it is about jobs and livelihoods, it is about all, all security and so on. Um, so, so, yeah. Then moving on to the growing policy appetites, it's not just an interesting academic exercise. We saw in Nagoya that there are five strategic goals, 20 headline targets. Um, the target one was about making people aware of the values of biodiversity. Target two was to make sure they're integrated. Um, we can move on. There's a specific focus on essential services and restoration, a focus on carbon stocks and, of course, the ABS. Um, and, of course, the evidence can support policies in a number of other areas on agriculture, fisheries, forestry and sustainable use. So we see a global dimension. We've already heard of IP Best. We've heard of the WAVES project as well. At the European level, and I won't go into too much detail because Lola Ledoux will talk on this on Friday, but there's a new biodiversity strategy with a vision, with headline targets, with a series of specific targets and actions within them, and you'll see, and Law will talk in greater detail, that ecosystem services are a key issue driving this. So they are very much listened to, to all the work of everyone in the room um, and, and are responding to that. In the UK, similarly, 
There's a, a UK Natural England white paper. They're recommending a natural capital committee to inform it, so again, to take it up to high levels of government. They're looking to have an annual statement of green accounts, uh, again, to make sure that they're not misusing uh, natural capital. And they're also looking at a business-led task force. And each of these things have been informed by the UK ecosystem assessment and the good work there. So you see at the global level, at the European level, at the national level, there is appetite and progress on, on policies taking ecosystems into account. And then the question to the audience later, maybe for the panel, is where in your countries have things been launched that, that also deal with that. And so more, more, more generally, there's the evidence on the value of ecosystems and biodiversity um, feeds into an impact assessment process. And I won't go into all the details, but in the UK, the Marine Conservation Zones decision has been affected by ecosystem service benefits. And there's a huge range of other policies. So the point is, valuation can be incredibly important uh, for legislative design uh, and implementation. So moving on to the instruments, in the T for Policymakers book, um, we talk about the global crisis and also the benefits. Then a, a, an important part is the whole thing of measuring what we manage, because unless we measure what we have, we can't actually manage it properly. So we talk about biodiversity indicators, ecosystem service indicators, beyond GDP type indicators, the GD of the poor, to integrate issues of the social dimension, natural capital and environmental accounts, as I've already mentioned before, a range of valuation and assessment techniques. Now each of these things obviously bring in the information base to support policy, and then there's available solutions. And I think it's uh, useful to, to remember that in any, all of this evaluation will provide certain bits of information, but we need to see the whole picture. Each site has multiple benefits. That's the slide on the top left. Each site has benefits, local, global, local national, and global. That's, the, that's the, the beautiful spider diagram on the right. Um, so pollination is very much local, uh, of course. And then, of course, on the, the, you need to have a spatial perspective to understand the interrelationships between provision and use. So all of this evidence is, is integral parts of, of the information for policy making uh, and there's major challenges in each. Then in terms of the putting the monetary in context, I think you'll find that the, as, you, as you try to understand, uh, understand ecosystems and the benefits, the monetary role is actually quite a small part. Um, there's a, it has to build on the quantitative review of the effects and understanding of the qualitative. So it's a part of, it builds on a number of other things. We should also not focus only on the monetary. And I think TEAB is called the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, but if you were to actually read uh, what we, we, we write, it's not all about economics, it's about appreciating value and you can use a range of different metrics. And that's the fundamental point. So it's qualitative, quantitative, monetary, spatial, the time dimensions and all the interactions. So then moving on to the different policy responses that we cover, um, of course protected areas are key, investment in natural capital are key, a range of instruments to reward benefits and here there's a bit of a paradigm shift and Rosemary already talked about payments for ecosystem service schemes uh, from all of their work. So there's the PES, there's RED which is a PES for reduced uh, emissions from deforestation degradation, there's tax incentives, market certification and labelling, green public procurement and whole issues about avoiding damage whether it's regulation or pricing. Now this is the policy toolkit that all of us have and I'm going to jump and look at a couple of these uh, but not all of them of course otherwise we'd be here forever. Um, but protected areas in, in Europe you've got 26,000 sites, 18% of the area and the prime objective is the conservation of unique and endangered biodiversity and I insist on this because we also don't want economics to go into overshoot because the prime objective is the biodiversity. The secondary, the co-benefits are the economic benefits. But there are a wide range of co-benefits, and here on the right is a bit of another, another spider diagram. We, we surveyed, uh, interviewed 200 uh, people from across Europe to say what they see as, as key ecosystem services uh, at the local, national, and global, and this is the picture that was created. Um, and a, an example that's been cited often is that uh, one-third of the world's 100 largest cities benefit uh, the drinking water from protected areas. And in Europe, it's Berlin, Munich, Vienna, Oslo, Brighton, etc., etc. So again, if you know which cities benefit from which protected areas, it would be great, great to know as well. Now, the protected areas help maintain or increase the ecosystem service flow. The key thing here is not to confuse the benefit of the, of the protection itself from the benefits coming from the ecosystem which is protected. So there's a careful uh, issue to bear in mind here. 
and generally, but with exceptions, there's synergies between conservation measures and the co-benefits. Okay? So, but again, that's with exceptions, and there's a huge need for, for research to understand the interrelationships between biodiversity benefits from conservation measures and to what extent they actually lead to ecosystem service benefits. And so, and interestingly, within the European context, the ecosystem service co-benefits are used increasingly as an argument to encourage sustainable financing, because what you're doing is creating public goods, so why not have public money is going to support public goods? So, I'm not sure how much time I have. Um, so, again, we've talked about the multiple benefits on protected areas. Uh, we know that they support climate change both in mitigation and in adaptation because better managed and better connected and better governed and better financed protected areas are recognized to support both of those. They have 15% of the global, the global carbon sink and they also help with adaptation through improved resilience. So we need to finalize the networks and we need to address the financing gap and ensure there's a sustainable financing gap. It's fi not sustainable financing gap, sorry. Sustainable financing to support the financing gap. Uh, but again, it's the policy synergies are not just about climate mitigation and adaptation. It also supports in Europe the cohesion policy, agricultural policy, the fisheries policy because of marine protected areas, with, with culture, with health. So again, and certainly within the European context of policy making, you can often have competition between different DGs. So ensuring that one presses the multiple buttons of the multiple benefits, one can try to bridge some of that and help in the mainstreaming. Then there's the issue of direct investment in natural capital. Um, the restoration and green ecological infrastructure is another tool, and monies can be public or private. They can be local, national to EU. And I think even DG Regio in its cohesion uh, regulations, which have come out soon, they've been starting to get excited about the concept of green infrastructure and seeing how that can be integrated, because this is real money being, being looked at. And the European Fisheries Fund is also looking at how one can think about integrating uh, the wider issue of ecosystem services in that. And of course there's many examples of, of that which I won't go into too much detail. Um, so, but one example is, is in Germany, the case of uh, a peatlands restoration. And the only point I wish to make here is that as one goes down, one realizes the CO2 avoidance cost can be 8 to 12 euros per ton, or with certain land use options, 0 to 4 euros per ton of carbon. And a lot of the policy debate is as well about carbon capture and storage using mining facilities or underground storage. You will not get 0 to 4 euros per ton of carbon by that. So if we're really really concerned about ensuring that we make pub, uh, proper use of public finance, we need to think as to where one can actually lead to uh, cost-effective carbon uh, storage issues. So restoration is key, not losing peatlands is key, uh, better agricultural practices for soil carbon is naturally key. So again, they lead to a series of multiple benefits, the carbon stores, the risk of flooding, coastal erosion. I think Bob's already gone through all of that as is Rosemary, so I won't repeat all of that. But the important thing here is the adaptation to climate change will receive b hundreds of billions of dollars in the, in the coming years. There's been this commitment, assuming it doesn't collapse, we have 100 billion or so euros to spend. Now, how much do we want it to be spent on man-made technological solutions like the levies, and how much do we want it to be spent on ecosystem-based adaptation, which can also lead to a range of co-benefits? So I think there's a real need to ensure that we have a menu of options and a, a realistic menu of options as to what natural capital solutions there are to basically compete with the, the man-made technological solutions in the, in the scramble for those funds. Um, another instrument is land use planning and here's just an example of a, a, a Toronto which is trying to understand the multiple benefits of its wider green infrastructure to help inform its, its policy making. So the question then is how many cities are actually trying to understand the real potential of, of the green infrastructure, the real value of their natural capital and then use it to inform their policy uh, decisions, their planning decisions. When it comes to PES, and as Rose Rosemary already introduced the theme, it's a beneficiary user pays principle plus the service providers get paid principle. And the aim of the PES is to change the economic equation so that people actually go for, for the maintenance or the restoration or the investment. And, and there's only so much money around, and as, as Rosemary said, that that's why they looked at the opportunity costs, because you can't compete with mega opportunity costs with limited funding. So you have to find out where your benefits will, where your payments will, will tip the balance. 
Um, globally, there's 300 programs in the world. It's around 8 billion. It's increasing at 10 to 20 percent a year. There's some which are public, some which are private, some which are uh, NGO-led. There's a range of different objectives. Some are big, some are small, and it's a very dynamic picture. There's new support in the Natural England White Paper. We see the, 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 the program there. So this is quite an exciting instrument. Um, and then just one example, which I think is, is particularly interesting, is from Mexico, is that they had an understanding of the issues of their hydro on the hydrological situation, the need for aquifer recharge, the issue of, of surface water quality uh, and flooding. They also understood that poverty is, is a critical aim and had good data, and deforestation and others. So they created a PES scheme to combine all of this information and address, basically have payments to often, often the poorer parts of the community to help manage forests, which has led to a, 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 a falling of deforestation rates uh, and carbon storage improvements, uh, avoided emissions, as well as improvements in the hydrological balance. So this is an example here of building on the uh, sort of a mapping and understanding of ecosystem service indicators and linking also to the social, uh, social uh, indicators of, of poverty and, and, so, and things like that. Um, we all know that there's deforestation happening and Red Plus is, is, a, is an instrument of great potential. The forests, about 17%, oh, sorry, deforestation could, is about 17% of global greenhouse gas emissions and there's a range of studies looking at the potential benefits of doing that. Um, the key thing I'd like to underline again is that this will go forward but there's major risks so we really need to ensure that we invest properly in confidence, experience, investment, you know, have allowed the evolu evolution of these instruments to make sure they really do live up to their expectations, they really do offer the full, not just the carbon benefits, but the, the, the wider benefits and also the social integration of the people there. So ABS is another thing, fortunately after 20 years discussion, um, there's finally been agreement on that at Nagoya. This is a critical ecosystem service, it's a critical issue of genetic knowledge, and it's a critical issue of fairness between North and South, between the people who have the biodiversity and the people who wish to make use of it. And the, uh, a point just to why we should celebrate the success of, of the ABS agreement, um, it's only seen as a first step, and more needs to be done. Okay, so that's a range of the policy instruments. So the point there is we have a toolkit. So for the main way forward, if you want to collapse the entire picture of the, of the world's demise of ecological natural capital into a single line, which is, of course, something which would make any professor a qui quiver, it's basically a green sloping line down. This is the development path that we're on, okay? Um, but this is the one we want to be on. We want the alternative natural de capital development path. We want to be able to slow biodiversity loss, halt biodiversity loss, lead to no net loss at a certain point, and then we want to realize the oppor positive opportunities of investment in natural capital. Okay, I think we all agree this is basically where we have to go. Whether we will actually get there is another question. And, of course, there are all these different instruments, regulation, governance, the range of economic ones, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, that, that contribute to it. Now, which, which instrument, which way forward we can make really depends on the country, on the institutional and instrument context. The potential interest and motivation across countries is very, very different. And it's, so the point is that not, there's no one size fit all. I think what we need to do is to encourage all the leader, all the vanguard to lead where they wish to be a vanguard and then we learn from them then we become early, early followers afterwards. And then hopefully there's as few laggards as possible. Now, the other thing to bear in mind that the environmental policy is not enough. We, the last slide was all about policy instruments, but it's also we need citizens to engage. It's not just the government, it's not just business, but it's also citizens, it's about consumption, it's about actions and positive actions themselves. And this is a, a good study which PBL did here in the Netherlands, um, and they showed that under different scenarios this is the type of biodiversity loss you can avoid. And the key thing here, I think, is that changing diets is a key aspect of a way forward so we need citizens and protected areas also is, is vital but overall the other conclusion to draw is that even with all of these 50 policy uh, these 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 different policy instruments we only get to half we only solve half the problem so we need integration beyond environmental policy um, so if you get back to our picture before first of all we actually need 
to engage everyone. So it's a global governance issue, it's the community uh, commission issue for our, in our context, member states or countries, regional authorities, cities, business. We need everyone. We've got a multi-level governance challenge with, with different incentives and opportunities for different people and everyone. All need to be engaged in this if we have any hope at all. Almost there. So the wider challenge is then we need to understand the science. And I think there'll be lots of presentations on that because there's, there's huge numbers of gaps in the interrelationships between the ecosystem components, the ecosystem functions, the ecosystem services, how they then relate back to the value. There's a huge need there. The economics as well, we've been doing a study on the value of Natura. The amount of information out there is far less than one would hope to be able to do that. So we need a major investment in studies, which is why when the, the rector or whoever gave the, the speech with this beautiful curve going up, I think we need, uh, we need that to keep going and we also need to make sure there's some geographic balance because we find that there's lots of things happening in the US and the UK but far less in some of the other countries. Um, we need more work on measurements, of course. The evidence base has to be in usable form for the key players. It's not... Um, and we need the action by the vanguard, the progress begets progress, and we need realistic steps as well. Integration decision making, we talked about, and policy instrument in integration and mainstreaming. As we saw, 50% of the solution can be provided by environmental policies and us acting on it as citizens. Um, but we need much more than that. We need all the other sectors uh, engaged. Uh, and, but policy implementation requires courage and conviction, uh, encouraged by the evidence that we communally create. And of course, we need to recognize and make use and create windows of opportunity. And on that note, I want to go to another important professor, Frank Convery. And in this time of fiscal crisis, uh, Ireland has realized that they've got to do something to respond. And to quote uh, Frank Convery, said, given that we in Ireland have to raise taxes, it makes sense to raise them in ways that simultaneously improve our environmental quality, provide incentives for a new low carbon enterprise, uh, ensure that we manage resources efficiently, which then includes the natural capital issues, help ob obligations, etc., etc., etc. So this is the common challenge. So in fact, we probably need this type of Green New Deal and this type of fiscal reform across all the countries of Europe, and I probably imagine other countries as well. So this is recognizing and responding to an opportunity, not that you want to see financial crisis as an opportunity. Okay? But there's also creating windows and opportunity, and this is where I get towards the end, is that in the process we, and I mean we in the wider sense, are creating opportunities for policy response by creating information that uh, stops, that, uh, that, that supports governments wish, wishing to move forward or business wishing to move forward or citizens wishing to be engaged. There's a range of TEAB country and regional studies that have been launched, TEAB Brazil, TEAB India, TEAB Netherlands, TEAB Nordics, TEAB Norway. I think there'll be some of them will be discussed tomorrow. And this is really creating a, a platform upon which there can be policy debate, the platform for policy decisions, and so that will create the opportunities of tomorrow. There's a various awa awareness raising things, the CBD is doing things, there's a range of other initiatives like the WAVES. There's new things happening on TEAB. But also the other lines at the bottom, I just wanted to underline that even before TEAB, there's a huge amount of work happening independent from this TEAB, and the ESP partnership is one. There's a parallel track, and Bob was way before, I think he's about over, over here. On, on, that, on that bottom, um, the bottom ones. And of course the ESP partnership I think is a critical one to take it forward. So to summarize, uh, for a T for policy, we need to make nature's values visible. We need to improve uh, the measurement to manage better. We need to change all the incentives because unless we change the incentives and have a sort of a more natural uh, price, we need to use Adam Smith's invisible hand to help the problem. But of course, economics and markets only go so far as already been mentioned on public goods. Protected areas and ecological infrastructure are key. Natural capital and the link to poverty is also absolutely essential and there's new movement and interest in the poverty and environment program and the development community in trying to find a way of integrating natural capital into development cooperation. And then of course we need to mainstream the economics of nature because otherwise we only deal with half of the problem and it's never sustainable. So just to end, just in case you're ever playing chess, is this really enough of the board for you to look at, for you to have a chance of winning this game of chess? And I think the same thing is for us and understanding the values of nature or, or ignoring the values of nature. We won't succeed unless we fully understand that. And the other thing, it's always better to look at the whole board and engage the full set of players. So we need 
all, all the players, the community here, the, pol the other policy makers and so on and so forth. And hopefully I've not done too much a disservice to the 100 authors. And if there's anything stupid said, that was definitely me. So thank you very much.